I'm not a big flag guy, but I want to ask you to ask yourself for a few minutes, uh, are you a patriot? I'm asking that myself. They just chased the girl and shot the twill town. They just chased the girl out west. I just want my nephew. I just want my nephew since they was down here with him. That's all I want is my nephew. Okay, what's your nephew? I just want my nephew. No, my nephew is down here. You can't record nothing, my nephew. And I ain't involved in nothing. Yes! Can I talk to you for a minute? Because this fucking shit, um, I this shit is every day! I understand, sir. I understand. I understand. Can we talk to you for a minute? Every fucking day! It's my fucking baby girl! Yeah, I know. And I swear! And I fucking swear! On my life! Y'all will be arresting me! I'm not a part of no games. I work every day. I'm not a part of any of this shit. I understand your business. And I fucking swear, bitches is a bitch. This is from this weekend, south side of Chicago, photographed by a Korean-American friend of mine, John Kim, Pulitzer Prize-winning photographer for Chicago Tribune. We're very divided about this video, all of us. We're judgmental. He's, he promises revenge. Among us and our comfort, we talk about innovation, etc. There's another America. It's the oldest problem. That's why I always say I'm not an innovator, I'm an archaeologist. Why are we so divided? Why is it that people in Chicago, which is an amazing city, if you love restaurants and museums, etc., a big chunk of our city, nightly? I took a flight yesterday to Providence. I was woken up at 5. Information starts coming through my cell phone, through text. I show up on a scene in Austin, on the west side of Chicago, a dead body. Turns out that person was shot in July, and now he's dead. He's covered yellow tapes and cops. We often, uh, uh, we're divided by Black Lives Matter, or All Lives Matter, or Cop Blue Lives Matter. Cops have a tough job. They handle themselves well at that moment. But the trauma uh, of African Americans in our society especially, 762 homicides last year in Chicago, 80% black. It's not a Chicago problem. It's not someone looking like me problem. I walk into great restaurants and I enjoy a great life. And yet, it is because of us. It is connected to Charlestown. It is connected to white supremacy. We can't get away from it. I can bring models to Chicago. I can work and build bridges. I'm very good finger in the dike. In Boston, I participated with the team that went from 152 homicides to 31. Last year in Providence, the institute that I helped found under PJ's leadership is somewhere here. First year I didn't lead it, had zero gang homicides for the first time in the history of this city. She's great. <laughs> I'm asking you, are you patriots? Two days ago we were thinking about the Twin Towers and what happened there. 
But do we think of them as our people? Honestly, do we? That grief and anger, the people absorbing every day. Are they our people? Are they Americans to us? Are we rationalizing the revenge? And why are they shooting each other? And we don't really see how it is that we have caused those environments. And we're not willing to put the resources to change that. And often, and I'll jump around a bit because it's my style, we find scapegoats too. We're liberals. I, I'm a liberal. I'm not assuming you're a liberal. This election, it was West Virginia's fault. Got news for you. Whites all around the country elected Trump. All right, watch, uh, read Tanasi Coates, current issue of The Atlantic. Let's not hide behind West Virginians, poor whites. They're part of our country, too, and we need to reach out to them, too. And nonviolence is often looked at as an additive, something you take as a choice, you know, one of those classes, elective. It is going to destroy us if we don't take it more seriously and start working on it. So what are we doing in Chicago? I know Chicago for a long time. There's really no pure model in this country. Bless you. <laughs> Just like Darwin worked within an environment and innovators, at his time he wasn't the only person who worked on evolution. Just like with computers, it wasn't just Steve Jobs. In our field, we borrow and steal from each other. We teach and we learn. So there is, people will claim it's a public health model, this and that. There are no pure models we keep. So I've had re in relationships since 99 with, with Chicago when they visited our work in Boston. But I was pushed hard four years ago, three years ago, to move to Chicago. It was a very difficult decision, uh, particularly since my two boys are here in Providence. Um, and I moved in October of 2015. It's, it's important. Because October 2015 now seems like a great time. A month later, Laquan McDonald's video was released. A young man who was shot 16 times by an officer. And when that video was released, he was killed the year before by order of a judge. The city went into paralysis. The police, somewhere between 80 to 90% drops in stops. You had the Ferguson effect, people are talking, which is a controversial term. And I won't have time to get into it here. But suddenly there's a huge drop in and what was bad in a city who didn't reform itself, unlike Boston, Providence, New York, and LA, this major city never reformed itself fully. Things got really bad and really fast. So I was asked to build an organization, the Institute for Nonviolence Chicago, that will ultimately work in three neighborhoods. And take your time, three years you don't have to fundraise, and everything will be great. They promised my board here that I can leave and I'll be in good hands. And months after I landed, their old bets were off. There was no one to talk to. The city went into paralysis. I left my organization that I built. I left life behind. So you talked about loneliness, et cetera, and oh yeah. And also, I turned 50 in December 26 of that year. I was looking forward to book a club here and celebrate with my friend, kind of a nice goodbye. Instead, I had a pretty lonely dinner just with my family, and I thought, what did I do? Um, it was a very tough winter with no one ready to talk to. And what I did is I went around 10 neighborhoods looking which one will I choose to start at. But basically, the grounds completely were shifting. Anger. The commissioner was fired, uh, who is someone who knew me from Newark and New York. Things changed drastically. We walked into neighborhoods. We did community sessions and hearings. We brought friends from LA. And we did community hearings. We did meetings in the community. We, did, we met with outreach workers. We met with gang members. We met with cops. We met with patrol people. We met with activists, politicians. And a lot of people were with me were turned feeling kind of bad because like, who are you? You're a white guy from the East Coast, and why you? And what are you doing here? Are you going to be a university doing two years study on us and then leave? Some people around me were offended how I'm being treated. I'm not some expert, and I should be treated like that. I told them months later that if you didn't ask me those questions, I would have thought you have no pulse. A lot of those people were really challenging me coming me, and rightfully so. 
ended up being allies and working now at the institute, but they had to check me out, and that is a fair process. People have been experimented along for too long. They want to know what you are about, what you're going to do. In about a year and a half, I probably did 500 one-on-ones, and I continue to do that. It's important. If you're going to build something, you're coming into other people's territory. You're coming into other people's thoughts and belief. You're not just implementing a model. So since then, last year in July, we launched the first outreach team in Austin, which was the most violent uh, neighborhood in uh, Chicago, as well as the most amount of people coming back from jail, twice the rate of other neighborhoods. Um, we added in victim services. We built up a training department. Providence and LA came to train our staff in nonviolence and outreach and police protocols. How do you act with that? It's very interesting, our field, because we have really the hope for American cities relies on two actually rival groups, law enforcement and the people they used to arrest, former gang members. One of our staff members was on death row. House, sexy housing calls himself. He's a big guy, massive guy. You cannot break this guy's happiness. Why? Because he was on death row. So every morning when he wakes up to go and deal with gang violence, to him this is the happiest day of his life. All right, he's an inspiration. Uh, you have Lisa, who recruited herself to be a COO. She was a prosecutor who realized that prosecuting people was getting us nowhere. You have Dion, who was convicted falsely for two homicides when he was 18, chained to a wall. I've seen through his trial when he just won reparations. He's a supervisor. People are deeply damaged. Commander Betts, who commands the 15th district in Austin. His father, his, sorry, his mother lives in Austin. He believes in radical collaboration with community members. The secret of this work is building bridges, having your opinions, but really my job as the leader, and it was in Provenance too, in a way is to be Muhammad Ali on the rope of dope. Suck it, get those punches from other people, absorb it for your team. Because people start with very different points of view, and someone needs to absorb the differences to soften them up. Whether it's your team, whether it's the cops talking about our guys, our guys talking about the cops, people suspicious of the University of Chicago researchers, whoever it is, to keep bringing them closer and closer. Chicago is on the verge. I'm optimistic about Chicago. I know around the rest. So that's actually something new I can tell you here. Um, Chicago is the national news now. I think actually elected Trump. It helped elect him uh, because it is Obama's city. Rahm Emanuel was the chief of staff. It is the dysfunction as far as Republicans were concerned about liberals and African Americans. So it was a great place to run on. Um, but after a year or so, 28 funders came together. Two initiatives run around jobs and cognitive behavior. Another one is around beefing up these collaborative models. We have launched partners and us. It's so another thing we had to adapt. One thing I said to myself when I moved to Chicago, I'm not coming to put and impose a dominant model on a city. It's not my place. It's disrespectful of a big city. Luckily, uh, Sal, who is listening, is uh, at the Institute in Providence, uh, an advanced trainer, always told me eight years ago, gave me a great gift on a drive back from Little Compton. He says, Tenny, you have a big ego. And that was a really great gift he gave me to remind myself and keep it a check. People who came with big models, etc., in Chicago failed. And there were quite a few before. So the model that we are working together now is really a, working a radical collaboration with others and learn from each other and keep each other working together. Uh, and that's sort of my role, um, is to listen, see the grievances. We are collaborating eight organizations with two very big ones. 28 funders, uh, eight or nine police districts, so there's a lot of moving pieces. Uh, I had to ask myself again and again and very often, at night alone in Chicago, will I fail? Can I fail? And I kind of smile sometimes in conferences like that. We talk about successes and risks. I really feel now, I felt when I came to Rhode Island, I had Sister Anne and Father Ray and others, I felt 
I always had a real back. In Chicago, my back is to the wall in many ways. I can fail. I can end up with nothing. But that's OK. You've got to let go. Someone else talked here about letting go of control. Um, I think that I'm a bit lost at the moment um, on a point. Uh, forgive me. Um, I had to ask myself, uh, am I willing to die? I'm 51 now. Uh, it almost happened in Israel. It almost happened in Boston once. It almost happened in Providence in Ellery Park. And I'm 51. I've done a lot. I can really try and keep from the distance. But, but the team needs to know if you respect their lives, you're willing to be with them. In fact, one of our supervisors told us CEO, we need to introduce some fear to Tenny because he's taking risks. They're just not used to seeing him out on those corners. But really, I feel that they got my back. They support me. I feel that um, in many ways, and that's something you should know about our field, people who engage in violence actually care about peacemakers. They want peacemakers to succeed. Um, they see the pain. They're caught in it. Uh, and one of the beautiful things we're able to convince in those two big initiatives is, which is something I learned here in Providence especially, we've built into our grants and a big project with our collaboration that our young people might have 9 to 13 setback. It happens in domestic violence. It happens in drug addiction. You cannot just take a group of young people and say, you have a new life at Moses Brown at a private school. It just doesn't happen that way. So really now probation and judges and police and others are starting to be introduced to the idea that they're not letting us down. They're not wasting our opportunities. We're walking with them. And, and it's interesting. I, I, I play a little bit. I love ethnographers, sociologists. So I was taking the Uber to the airport two days ago, yesterday. And I, I, I typed on my phone like three pages of a 62-year-old African-American Uber driver who is from New Orleans, moved 40 years ago to Chicago. And he was pretty accusatory of the young generation, which is not surprising. And partially, I'm sitting in the back. And I have privilege. I had to give him the license to talk about race. He didn't mention the word race once, 40 minutes ride. Right? So a lot of the blame was of young people. And I very gently asked him, after I let him speak, and I just typed. I said to him, is there anything that is not their fault? Uh, you know, they're not waking up to work. They are jobs. They did, da, 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 da. It's really the, 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 all that it goes in us. Those things, those stories are important because that goes through our minds. Right? When we say someone is not making an effort, we don't need to invest. It is their fault. We will build jails. Not to mention that when I speak with the business community in Chicago, and in November, there was a new building. License was taken out on to build a building that is a billion dollar building. Right? Ginny Gang, she is the most famous woman architect in the world, is building buildings like crazy. In Abu Dhabi and in Chicago, there is wealth. But I'm, when I meet with the business community and the leadership, I tell them I'm really disappointed with your lack of imagination. Chicago could have a GDP that is five times what it is. We're all paying for the fact that downtown is one of the most greatest places there is. And you go to other neighborhoods, you have so many boarded up buildings. And finally, I'll touch, it says wrap up. If we succeed, and I hope we will, we have in other places, we will need to think about gentrification. It's not over. When you are a minority and in a poor neighborhood, you live under violence and trauma. But if we succeed and you actually live in peace, the seven good years in Joseph's dream, we then push you out. In the last 10 years, 200,000 African Americans left Chicago. 200,000, it's a significant number. We're closing down the schools. We're eliminating the civil things that help build our young people. And I'm sorry, this is not on this young man who just wants revenge. 
uh, he's left almost with no option. The fact that he's screaming it so loud, I don't think he will take revenge. But he's telling us the frustration and the pain, which I hope stays with us, that we are designing those pressures that are unbearable. And I'm here just as a witness. Thank you.